Hey, this is Matt Cox, and I, at this point, I'm telling my story. There's a bunch of videos, a uh, combination of videos telling my true crime story. At this point, I've been caught. I'm now locked up in a marshal's holdover in Atlanta. And uh, yeah, so the last video I went over how I got caught. At this point, I've been arrested. I've been moved to the marshal's holdover in Atlanta. Actually, I'm not in the Marshall's Holdover at this point. I'm in the Marshall's Holdover in Atlanta City Detention Center. That's where I am because there's actually something called the Marshall's Holdover at the U.S. At the, uh, US um, uh, prison in Atlanta. So I'm there. My lawyer and I are, have been talking. Uh, I've got a pre-sentence report that says I've got, I'm getting 26 years. The government has, I've all, I'm being, inter I was interviewed by the Secret Service and the U.S. Secret Service and U.S. Marshals. What am I saying? I was interviewed by the Secret Service and the FBI. When I was interviewed by the Secret Service, that was actually comical because when I was interviewed by the Secret Service, when I first sat down, my lawyer and I sat down with the Secret Service, there were two agents there. One was Agent, agent Peacock, who's a female agent, Andrea Peacock, and the other guy was Dan Brunzowski, I think his name was Dan Brunzowski. Brunzowski, I don't know. It's it's in my book. It's long. It's a long one. I remember they sat down and we hadn't been there maybe five or ten minutes when we finally they had their stuff all arranged. And they started qu questioning me, and one of the first things that Dan said was, "Listen," he said, "I I we first thing we need to go over is we need to know where all the money is," and I said. You've got all the money. What are you talking about? And he said, no, no, we know you've hidden money. And I went, hidden money? What are you talking about? Like, I haven't hidden any money. And he said, you know, we know for a fact that you have money hidden in an account. Now, you're about to get an obstruction of justice charge unless you come clean with us right now. So I remember my lawyer was like, her name is Millie. Millie, she leaned and she goes, do we need to talk about this? I said, no. I said, I have gave him all the money. I gave him money and, you know, there was money in... In, in a bunch of different bank accounts that I had already given them. And I said, what are you talking about? And he pulled out several bank statements and put them in front of me. Boom. And he said, you have, I think it was 200000 roughly two hundred. You have $200,000 in Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. And I looked down and he had these these bank statements and the funny thing about the bank statements is Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville was one of the banks that I had created so this is a bank and bank statements that don't even even exist it's it's, it's complete forgery he goes we know you've got two hundred thousand dollars in that bank in the name of Walter Holcomb and I looked at him and I went did you call the bank and he said yeah I called the bank he goes, I've, I've left several messages he goes we've already subpoenaed the records and I go, did you go to the website? And he went, yeah, I went to the website. And I go, what'd you think? He goes, what do you mean? I go, what'd you think of the website? And he goes, it's a bank website. I go, yeah, but it was, it's professional. Like, I mean, it's, you know, convincing. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, Jesus Christ. He goes, I, are you serious? He goes, I, and, and so at that point, the U.S. attorney and the other agents, my lawyer, they go, what are you talking about? And he looked at me and he goes, he goes, it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. I go, it's all an illusion. I said, the bank doesn't exist. And he said, he goes, I can't believe it. Are you serious? I go, who did you call? He goes, I, I, I said, did any, nobody answer? He goes, no, I left messages. And I was like, I haven't paid the voicemail in months. Like I've been arrested. By this point, I've been arrested for several months. So I was like, who, how did you even leave a voicemail? And he's like, I, I left several. And I, who did you subpoena? He goes, I looked it up. It's a real bank. Now, it was. There was a Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. I actually had opened an account there at one time in one of my fake identities' names. So I had a check that had the routing number for Southern Exchange Bank. And I had used that on all the fake checks that I'd made. And I'd used that on everything. So that was the number he looked up. And he saw that there really was a Southern Exchange Bank. But it wasn't Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. And so my, the website I had created was southernexchangebankofclarksville.com. 
So he thought that Southern Exchange Bank and Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville were the same thing, and he thought it was a real bank, and he actually subpoenaed Southern Exchange Bank's main office, which didn't even exist anymore because the bank had been sold to SunTrust Bank or something. So you know he was waiting for these bank statements. So I just looked at him, and I just was like, bro, what, what's going on? And I remember he, go, he said, oh, I can't believe that. And I looked at him, and I remember I said, bro, you're the Secret Service. And I was like, I can't believe you believe this. I mean, and that was the first time I was actually embarrassed that they'd caught me. So at that point, we ended up talking. He was like, hey, who was involved? Who helped you here? Who helped you there? At, with the Secret Service, I, I wasn't able to really tell them anything, to be honest. There was very little I could tell them because they didn't enter the picture until I was on the run. So once I was on the run, it was really just me and Rebecca Houck, and she'd already told them everything. Now, there were people in Nashville that knew what I was doing, a little here, a little there, but not a ton. And, you know, I, and I did say, look, this person and this person and this person, but they had been interviewing these people, and most of these people had either already cooperated or, or they'd said they didn't know anything, and that wasn't true. But nobody in, in Nashville, I think, ended up getting indicted. So that actually was Secret Service. That went on for several days. I was interviewed with them by them for several days. So then weeks later, I was interviewed by the FBI. And that's when I met Aunt, uh, Agent Candace Calderon with the FBI. And she was the woman that I called when I was driving back from um, Texas. She was the one that I talked to on the phone. She despised me. And so she came in, and I'll never forget when I, I had the handcuffs on, right? I'd been shackled and chained and walked up to the, to the um, U.S. Attorney's Office, and I was in a, uh, in a room where they, you know, debrief you. And I remember she un, they, un, they took the chains off me, and I was rubbing my wrists, and, I, and she goes, your wrists hurt? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, get used to it. I mean, it's like she was constantly making these little snide comments. And uh, so I interviewed her, and I remember one of the first things they wanted to know was that I had actually, when I was in Tampa, I'd actually bribed a politician named uh, Michael White. And I'd also used the name, well, this guy's name was Kevin White. I'd used the name Michael Kevin White. Because I'd seen this guy, I'd met this guy, and I'd seen his uh, signs all over the place. And so I thought it was funny because I was using all these color-coded names like red, blue, silver. And I saw white, I saw Kevin White, so I used the name Michael Kevin White. And then I ended up meeting that guy. And I ended up bribing that guy and got him elected to city council. Now, I got him elected to city council. That's a long story in and of itself, but... The point is, is I got him elected and he was going to rezone all of my vacant lots in Ybor City. But I took off on the run before any of that could happen. So they immediately were like, look, we've got tons of checks from you and these color-coded names and their accounts going to his campaign contribution. And they had already talked to one of my business partners, which was a guy named David Walker. And Dave Walker had told the FBI that I had bribed this guy and helped get him elected to city council. Well, to, to the county commission. No, not county commission. City council. City council to city council. So, um, so they asked me about that. And I was like, yeah, I mean, they've got the checks. Yeah, this is what happened. I bribed the guy. I mean, I got him elected and explained all that. And she was like, did he know this? Did he know that? Yeah, he knew all that. So we talked about that. We talked about uh, the various people that were involved in the scam. Most of those people had already been indicted. Uh, my actual conspiracy, my actual indictment in Tampa has a bunch of names with initials. So it's like my name and then a, it's a bunch of initials. They're unnamed co-conspirators because these are people that were cooperating. And so they indict, indicted me, but they don't want to show that to anybody. So they use them. So technically they'd been indicted. Um, but all these people were also cooperating against me. So, you know, they already knew a ton of stuff. I explained exactly what happened, told them everything that happened. And that interview went on for like three days, 
two or three days or maybe four days. Like I think I was interviewed by the FBI for like three or four days. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. And if you're interested in buying a painting from me, my contact information is in the description box. Back to the video. So then I go back to, you know, I go back to my cell. Uh, after the three or four days, I go back and um, the eventually I get my PSI. My PSI says 36, there says 32 years to life is what it says. Now, I'd also been interviewed by Dateline. At this point, Dateline had come out. The one-hour special came out, and it was horrible. It was called The Thief of Hearts. And it was the person they mainly interviewed was uh, Rebecca Halk. Rebecca basically said, look, Matt Cox is a, is a con man. He convinced me to commit crimes. I'm innocent. I didn't really know what I was doing. He's a Don Juan. He, he forced me to fall in love with him. Uh, you know, it, just, it, was just, it was just complete bullshit. But the one thing that was true that she said was, I'm charismatic which is true. I'm very charismatic. Charming. She said charming. Charming came up a lot. Anyway, uh, so what, what happened with that was that Dateline had come out, but Dateline also, I'd been caught. So they wanted to interview me. So they came, they got the U.S. attorney to, um, uh, they got the U.S. attorney to be interviewed, the Secret Service agent, and they came into the prison and they interviewed me. The U.S. attorney's office asked me to be interviewed by Dateline. Which I was in, inter, I was interviewed by them. I didn't want to be interviewed, but they told me if you are interviewed, we'll consider it substantial assistance. Substantial assistance means you've cooperated with the government, and they can reduce your sentence as a result of it. They said if you're interviewed, we'll consider it substantial assistance. So I was interviewed by them. I was also interviewed by the FBI and the Secret Service, which also was supposed to be considered substantial assistance. They said we'll consider that substantial assistance. Fine. So the night before. I'm about to be sentenced. I call my lawyer and I said, hey, what's going on? How much time am I going to get? Because I have a pre-sentence report that says 32 years to life. Now, we had negotiated after I got that 32 years to life. I was like, well, I'm not going to plead guilty. I want to take my plea back because I might as well go to trial. That's the maximum sentence you can give me is 30 years is bank fraud. Maximum you can get on bank fraud is 30 years. Max and then I got an extra two years for aggravated identity theft. So it's 32 years to life. I'm like, the maximum sentence you can give me 32 years. So why would I plead guilty? I might as well go to trial. I, if, if I lose, I can only get 32 years to life. So they said, look, what do you think doesn't apply to you? So they actually sent the Secret Service agent down to the prison with my lawyer, and we argued for about 30 minutes to get it from 32 years down to 26 years and four months. But my lawyer kept telling me, don't worry. When we get in front of the judge, I'm going to argue these enhancements, and I'm going to get them taken off, and you're going to end up with 13 years, 12, 10, 12 to 13 years. Okay. So the night before my sentencing, we've already agreed to 26 years and four months. But I'm supposed to get, I'm also supposed to get a sentence reduction and my lawyer is going to argue to reduce my enhancements. So I call her up and I said, hey, what did the U.S. attorney say? And she says, oh, Matt, I'm so sorry. They're not going to recommend a reduction in your sentence. They're going to recommend you get 26 years and four months. But don't worry, I'm going to argue the enhancements and you're probably going to end up with 12 or 13 years. I was like, why wouldn't, why aren't they going to recommend that I get a reduction? I was interviewed by the FBI, by the Secret Service, and I was interviewed by Dateline. And she said, I know, but Matt, nobody's been arrested. And that's really what a reduction is, where you cooperate and someone's been, someone's been arrested. And nobody's been arrested on your case by in, based on anything that you said. But don't worry, they're going to investigate and those people will be arrested. And at that time, they'll reduce your sentence. So tomorrow, you're probably going to get into 12 or 13 years. And then later, when you get to prison, your sentence will probably be cut down again, maybe even by half. And I thought... Oh my God. I mean, first of all, it doesn't really matter what I thought. That's what was happening. Like you can't say, oh, forget it. I don't want to be sentenced. No, you're going to sentencing tomorrow. So you just deal with it. So the next day I go to sentencing. I'm led in the courtroom. The U.S. attorney goes on and on and on about all of these. Mr. Cox did this. Mr. Cox did that. 
she provides like a 40 page timeline of all these things that I had done. Once I went on the run, it's 42 pages of fraud, not including a small summary of three or four pages from when I was in Tampa. And that's the bulk of my crime was in Tampa. So, plus I got my PSI. My PSI is like 52 pages, which is massive. Most PSIs are five pages, 10. Um, anyway, I get in front of the judge. U.S. attorney says that I'm a complete scoundrel, scumbag, uh, con man, can't be trusted, have to be taken out of society to protect society. My attorney gets up and says that he's really just, he's just a misunderstood guy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the judge read some letters from my friends and family. I remember my uncle wrote a letter. And he's a lawyer. And I remember he said to the judge that Mr. Cox is an extremely disturbed person. <laughs> and, then, and I remember thinking, like, when my lawyer read it, she was like, Mr. Cox has always had problems. He's always had um, issues with, like, he, he, like, this is a guy that I saw once a year, maybe. And he starts explaining that I've had, I've always had uh, emotional problems. I've always had learning disabilities. I've struggled growing up, struggled in school, and that I, I'm an extremely, dist and, and that I, from what he can tell, I'm a disturbed person. But out of love for his sister, my mother, he's writing this letter and asking for a lenient sentence. And I mean, it was like, it was like, it was the worst letter. This is a defense attorney. It was the worst letter you could have possibly written from an officer of the court saying, this guy has problems. <laughs> That's my uncle. He's a douchebag. And just a complete scoundrel and scumbag. And always has been, really, to be honest. Did you know, this is a guy, by the way, this is a guy that graduated first in his class in law school. Ended up being a bottom-of-the-barrel attorney, really. Like doing wills. He does wills. He does real estate. He does some, some criminal law. He does some, like, it's like you were the top of your class. And you were doing bottom of the barrel law work. And he wrote this fucking letter that just was horrible. Like my attorney was like, you know, I don't even think I want to send this to the judge. She's like, I talked to him on the phone. Like, I don't understand. I tried to, she tried to call, talk to him and be like, what did you write? Like she called, she was so bad. My public, my, my, my um, public defender called him to be like, what did you do? This is your letter? Anyway. And she gave it to the to the judge, though. She did give it to the judge. I mean, look, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what he said because I was done. So the judge has read all these letters. And the judge, I remember the judge said that Mr. Cox, what Mr. Cox did was borderline sociopathic in nature. Oh, I mean, he, listen, I wish I had the transcript. It was scathing what he said to me. And honestly, probably pretty accurate. But that's not the point. Point, it was harsh. It was harsh. It was, you know, you see that guy on TikTok, there's the emotional damage. That guy that, you know, emotion. That's how I felt. Like, oh my God, this is a federal judge. Like he really, whew, it was bad. Anyway, I ended up not getting the reduction and I ended up getting, um, I got 26 years and four months. I typically don't say 20, the four months. I typically say I got 26 years because if you say 26 years and four months, it, it sounds like I'm whining, you know, it's saying like, oh, 20, like four months, like that was overkill, but really the 26 years in general was overkill. So I got 26 years and four months and, um, yeah, I tried to, uh, you know, I've, obviously I stood up and I gave him my little, hey, oh God, did I, I didn't even tell you about my aunt. My aunt stood up and spoke for me. My aunt said it was a, wa she was a taxpayer and it was a waste of taxpayer money to put me in jail for, for that long. I and mean, that's not really an argument that I'm a taxpayer, your honor, and it's a waste of taxpayer, of my tax dollars to put him in jail. <laughs> 
<laughs> look, I look. She's also has a lot of money. She does. She and my my uncle uh, is extremely wealthy, and she very much feels like anyone that works for the government is like um, a servant. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Yeah, is is subservient, or they are someone who works for her. Like she, these are not people that you know. People of means feel like you, they. <laughs> People that work for the government are subservient. So she's basically lecture, almost kind of came off like a lecture to the judge. Like, you're on, it's a waste of my money. Like, you, you need to listen up. I'm, anyway, yeah, it was bad. Uh, so that didn't help. Really, I had nobody that really helped me. Nothing, anyway, it wouldn't have mattered. It, it, the per, anybody could have stood up. They could have been perfectly eloquent. It didn't matter. My PSI said 26 years. You get 26 years. So he gave me 26 years and four months. Um, I tried to talk. I cried like a fucking small child. Uh, then on my way, after I got the 26 years and I was leaving, I don't think I, I stopped crying until I got to the U, to, down to the, to the um, probably the, the U.S. Marshals, like the holding cell. And when I walked in, I remember there was this, there's a bunch of, you know, there's a bunch of tough guys, but there was this one guy that was like, uh, just this flamboyant gay guy. And when I walked in, I had just got control of myself. And I walked in and one of the guys goes, how much did you get? Like, they, like you go to a holding cell where the, you're waiting to be put on the bus to be driven back to the U.S. Marshal, to the Marshal holdover. And he looks at me and goes, what'd they, what'd they give you? And I go, to, over 26 years. And the gay guy goes, oh my God. They, oh my God, they didn't, the, the judge didn't throw the book at you. He jumped over the, uh, he jumped over the bench and bludgeoned you to death with it. Oh my God. And I just was thinking, I mean, even, even in the gay guy's voice, it sounded brutal. I mean, he did, he, he did the whole, oh my, you know, the whole way it was fucking, it was just, just, a, just a bad day. It was a bad day. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the video. Wanted to let you guys know one of the ways I pay for all of this is through Patreon subscriptions. So if you join my Patreon at the top tier, you get a different painting every single month. The contact information for Patreon is in the description box. Back to the video. Yeah, I got 26 years. And uh, so then I go back to the... It's so funny too because when I went back to the, to the Marshall's holdover, they dropped me off and everything. Th this is funny because I remember I got... I was, we were all let in, in and there's like 10 of us and we're sitting there chained up. And I remember they were calling four o'clock count and they go, you know, Johnson, you know, Thomas. And when they got to me, they go, you know, Cox. And there was an officer Cox. Now keep in mind the staff in Atlanta, all the officers were black. So when they got to me and, and he goes, he goes, Cox. And I went here. And he goes, Cox, he goes, you're not related to Officer Cox, are you? And all the officers start laughing. And I go, well, my dad did get around a lot when he was younger. We may be related. Like that. And the officers all stopped laughing and all the inmates started laughing. Um, so, yeah, they, they called me out. They, they called out a roll call. They brought us upstairs. I walked into the unit once again. I was in control of myself again. And when I walked in, there's about 100 guys in that unit. And as soon as I walked in, everybody looks over at me because I'd just been on TV where they'd said I got 26 years and four months on television. Like they, they, my roommate told me, bro, they, they, it just went off television. Like the six o'clock news or the five o'clock news, it just said it. And as soon as it was done, they popped the door and we all walk in and they like, we're talking about like a hundred guys looked at me at once boom, and looked at me and they were just like shaking their head. Boom. I immediately start crying again immediately hit me again so i go to my cell i walk in i have like maybe 10 guys come in going bro it's gonna be okay it's okay you're, you're gonna be okay you can appeal it you can this you can that all of that's not true um but you know this is the things that people tell you to try and you know get you through it and make themselves feel better i guess uh so yeah that was a bad day about 10 days later i was placed on a bus and i was driven to the medium security prison at Coleman in Coleman, Florida, Coleman, Florida, the complex. There's a Coleman, Florida. It's a complex, and it's the largest prison complex in the United States. It's got two penitentiaries, 
which, you know, two pins, and it's got a medium security prison, a low security prison, and a camp, which at that time was a, was for females. So it was all male except for the camp, which was females. It's now male. Uh, I was placed in the medium. This is funny. When I got there, I remember, you know, they, inter- they interview you, and they were interviewing me, and I remember the guy from... SIS, which is internal security for them, they kind of they're like the internal FBI for them. The guy was interviewing me and he goes, Yeah, bro, he's like, you shouldn't even be here. Like you're at a medium security prison. Like this is for violent inmates and stuff and guys that have life sentences. And he was like, Yeah, you really shouldn't even be here, Cox, but you have so much time. You have to go to a medium. You have to. Do you have to be below 20 years to go to a low? And even with good time. My out date was 2030. Like I still had 24 years to go. With no good time, my out date was like 2035 or something. Or no, sorry, like 2032 or something like that. So my out date was 2030. And this was in 2006. No, 2007 because it took a year. So late 2007 was when I was sentenced. Um, I was arrested... Um, in 2000 late 2006 so this is late 2007 i'm at the medium and i remember the guy said i said hey can i call somebody and i called my mother this is what a gangster my mom is bro so this is my mom when i called her she said i said hi mom and she was like oh matthew how are are you okay i was like i'm fine i said she goes, where are you i said i'm i'm at coleman prison and she goes, are you at the medium or are you at the low the fuck like i didn't even know i didn't know anything about coleman and she goes are you at the medium of the <laughs> and i went i'm 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 at the medium and she goes she goes okay i need you to look up your your cousin reese his name is reese townsend he's jack's cousin and i went jack has a cousin in prison she goes yes she said i said well he's not my cousin and she goes well for, it, for all intensive purposes, in this situation, in prison, he's your cousin. So he works in. She goes. He works in. Um. He works on the on the. Uh, he works in maintenance. She goes. He works in the maintenance crew. Uh. He's in one of the units. Ask ask around. You'll find him. He's gonna take care of you. And I was like, uh, okay. She goes, okay. I'll be up to see you in about a, in about a, a few weeks. I have to get placed on your visitation list like my mom knows how prison works better than i do within a couple days i find i track a uh, reese tracks me down and uh, my mom shows up a couple weeks later i remember the first day i'll tell you the first day story and then that that's then i gotta i gotta end this the first day i'm there i go to pill line right because I'm, I'm at this point, I'm so stressed out and anxiety and, and just, I'm just dying. Like I'm taking Paxil. It's a, like an anxiety drug. So I go to pill line and I go there and I get my Paxil. You have to take a pill. They won't give you a bottle because, you know, we're your children. So I take the Paxil and I'm walking back and I go to walk in the unit and there's a Sally ports, right? So you have to stop. You go in one door and then they have to open the other door, let you in. So I'm standing there with this black guy and I... And this is how absurd the situation is. And this is how foreign it is to me, even though I've already been locked up a year. But this is how foreign the environment is and how unprepared I am. I, as I walk up, I go to grab the door and it's locked. And I, I pat my pants and I go, man, I don't have the key, my key. You got your key? To the black guy. And he goes, man, I ain't no snitch. Motherfucker, I ain't no snitch. Well, he said, I'll show my paperwork. I ain't no snitch, motherfucker. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I go, bro, what, 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 what are you talking about? And he's sitting there and he's looking at me and he goes, man, you, what are you trying to say? I said, I, bro, I don't know what the deal is, man. And he looks at me and he goes, man, you just get here? And I went, yeah, bro, I just got here today. And he looked at me and he goes, man, he said, I go, what did I say? And he goes, man, you asked me if I got the keys. And I went, yeah, because the door's locked. And he goes, Nah, man, that's like you calling me a snitch. Only the police got the got the keys. Only Popo got the keys. I ain't got no keys. Only snitches got the keys. And I went, oh wow, bro. Listen, man, I got no. I had no idea. That's what I didn't know how you were gonna take that. I was just playing around. Is man, you gotta watch yourself, man. You are gonna get hurt. You are gonna get hurt. Listen, bro. It it was that bad. Like I mean, I walked in and I had a celly. They assigned me a celly. 
And we're talking very quickly when I got there, very quickly they start they start screaming over the loudspeaker, recall, recall, and guys start running around the unit, grabbing stuff, doing this, microwaving stuff, screaming. The cops are screaming, get in your cell, get in your cell. And they walk to the first first cell and lock it, second cell and lock it. Guys are running and scattering. I'm just standing there looking around while they're screaming recall. Well, my celly was a Mexican. He comes running up to me and goes, he goes, hey, man, you got to get in the cell. Cox, we got to go in the, we got to go. He goes, bunky, bunky. We got to go to the cell. We got to go to the cell. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? He goes, somebody got stabbed in the yard, man. I go, oh my God, someone got killed in the yard. He goes, nah, man, they didn't get killed. They just got stabbed up a little bit. Let's go. And I thought, this is a place where he said, got stabbed up a little. They just stabbed him up a little bit. Like, that's where you're at. You can get stabbed up over a gambling debt. Like, somebody owes somebody $20 and won't pay him. He gets stabbed up a little bit in the yard. Like, there's no little bit of stabbing, in my opinion. So, or you say the wrong thing, and some guy's ready to fight you because I was joking around saying, hey, do you have your keys? I mean, it was it was such a foreign environment. And uh, ultimately, I get my sentence cut twice. And I'm going to do another segment of videos where I explain how I got my sentence cut. And it is extremely interesting and devious and, um, yeah, it's, uh, and, and telling. So if you like the video, do me a favor and, uh, subscribe, hit the bell. So you get notified, leave me a comment and I'm going to go back to the beginning and watch them all over again. We're going to put them in a, um, in a playlist so that you can watch the videos and I appreciate you watching. And basically that's my story up until the point where I got to prison and really appreciate you watching and see ya.